So a lot to unpack here. Let's just run through some of what has happened over the past few months. Back in October, the U.S. Department of Education, the Office of Federal Student Aid, they find, they find your university, Grand Canyon University, $37.7 million. The claim at the basis of that, and we'll get into this, of course, they claim that there was deception of students um, in regards to a doctoral program. And then at the same time, right after that, you had the Federal Trade Commission um, going after the university, accusing a number of things there. Uh, very similar, though, to the Department of Education. Uh, there were some considerations around nonprofit status and then telemarketing claims. So we'll get into some of that. But what was your initial reaction to hearing about the fine and then the lawsuit? Uh, it, it, unbelievably disappointing, uh, incredibly disappointing. You know, th this uh, all started um, 14 years ago when we came. Uh, Grand Canyon was in a very difficult spot. 900, 900 students on campus, $20 million in debt. Uh, the campus was, uh, building had been built shortly after World War II. We switched from a nonprofit to a for-profit status and went to the public markets to get access to capital. We wanted to make private Christian higher education affordable to all socioeconomic classes of Americans. And, and um, it, the, the plan worked better than we thought. Um, you know, 10 years later, uh, we're, you know, we're sitting in a very, very good spot. The campus is growing like crazy. The online campus is growing. We put $2 billion into the campus. And so uh, we saw an opportunity to go back as a nonprofit university. We thought for the, the legacy of the institution would be best served by doing that. We had very good reasons for doing it. We went through the process and uh, the, the IRS who has the authority to do that work did it and said, the operation you've set up qualifies as a nonprofit and, and we're giving you the legal authority to operate as a nonprofit. And then uh, the state of Arizona reinforced that. And those are the two agencies that have the authority to do that. Um, and so a couple, a uh, few months later, we found out that the Department of Ed was not going to recognize our nonprofit status. Uh, we worked with them for four years. They didn't really work with us, but we worked with them because that was the best thing uh, for the university. And um, we were operating very effectively as a nonprofit institution. After four years, they said, uh, we're not going to recognize your nonprofit status. Uh, we'll continue to treat you as a for-profit entity. And so we filed a complaint. Once we filed that complaint, the, re the retaliation started. The FTC, the Department of Ed, and the VA in, in Washington had publicly stated that they were going to go after for-profit institutions because their default rate on student loans was higher than the national average. Well, number one, we weren't uh, at for-profit. We were operating as a nonprofit. Number two, our default rates are less than the national average. Um, and yet they, the uh, department, opened up a program review. They kept that program review open. They looked and they looked and they looked and they looked uh, to try to find something that they could uh, uh, hold us accountable for. Uh, and the, finally, they centered on this doctoral thing that somehow we miscommunicated the time and cost it, it, it takes to complete a doctoral uh, degree. Well, we presented at seven major conferences throughout the country because we're recognized as leaders in this area of transparency cost in time to complete a degree at all levels. Uh, and so we were shocked by um, what they were saying. Uh, and and uh, it, it kind of went downhill from there. Uh, they, did, they did their investigation. They issued the fine. Uh, and then the FTC jumped on, as they said they were going to. I mean, they were just doing what they predicted they were going to do. And uh, basically leveled the same a accusations. Um, and, uh, and so that was... That's how that all evolved. And, and we got to this point now because uh, we filed an appeal, obviously. We said to them, it doesn't matter whether the fine's $37 million or $1. We're not paying it because what you're saying, the, very, the opposite is true. Um, and we are extremely transparent. We're known for that. We take pride in that. And, uh, and so obviously we're going to contest this. And right now it's under appeal. Um, I want to go back to to one thing. What was their reason? So the the IRS said you guys could be nonprofit status. You could have that status. What was the Department of Education's reason for not recognizing you as a nonprofit and continuing to treat you as a for profit? They didn't give an official reason. Uh, you know, uh, they asked us to respond to a, a letter that they had sent. There were seven or eight items they asked us to respond to, 
We responded and offered a compromise on all of them. They never got back to us and they never gave us an official reason why they weren't recognizing our status. Uh, we were operating very effectively that way. Uh, and the IRS had, had um, wh whose authority it is to make that determination, make the determination. The department, there's nothing in writing anywhere that says the Department of Education has the authority to make that decision. They've never made that decision in the past. This was an unprecedented move levied against the, the largest Christian university in the country. Well, you know, and it's interesting, in the Department of Education statement, and I'm going to read the quote, they said that GCU did not contest the FSA, that's the, you know, the Department of the Education, just for viewers, um, that we're talking about here, determination that 98% of students enrolled in certain doctoral programs had to pay more than GCU's advertised costs. So they're saying that, that the university has never said that's not true. Is that, is that accurate? Because that statement is in their press release. We are extremely mainstream when it comes to doctoral programs and the completion of them. Uh, they involve a dissertation. The dissertation is a process that takes different lengths of time depending upon um, the student and the committee and a lot of factors. Um, and so uh, when you go out and look at what we communicate to students and you can compare it to 100 other schools, many of them Ivy League schools, which we have done, our communication around the fact that um, very few students complete uh, in the minimum amount of time necessary. Um, and there are courses that you have to take to get the support that you need to complete it. And it takes students varying lengths of time to do that. And so our communication is extremely mainstream. It's very transparent and it's far more transparent than 95% of the universities out there with regards to that issue. Um, if they had a, 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 any kind of uh, complaint, and, and, number, and, and secondly, uh, there were no student complaints. I asked them repeatedly for student complaints because we'll follow up on them. That's the normal process that takes place when these things happen. There were no student complaints. We never got them. And so uh, if there was some concern about the accuracy or clearness of our communication, it could have been resolved in a 10 or 15 minute phone call. What they did is look and look and look until they could find something that they could uh, nitpick at and then find us an astronomical amount of money. Um, Are you aware which, of any other university? $37.7 million is, is a lot of money. Has there ever been a fine to your knowledge that was that high? No. No, and, and you know, just to give you points of comparison, uh, Penn State had an issue a while back with the assault of young men on their campus, young boys on their campus that went on for 10 years. They were fined about $4 million for not disclosing that information. Uh, the, uh, Michigan State had an issue with uh, a trainer assaulting young girls for many, many years. Uh, they hid that information. They didn't disclose that information. They were fined about three and a half million dollars. So this $37 million stands in unbelievable contrast, especially when you consider that there was one student who contested uh, the communication uh, that we had about time and cost to complete the degree in Georgia a number of years ago. And that case was heard uh, in the 11th Circuit. Uh, district Court judge ruled that our, that our uh, communications were clear and concise. They appealed it to the appellate court that judge ruled the same thing. Uh, and then you follow that up with a higher learning commission being here, doing an in-depth review of everything that we do, our accrediting body. And they said, with regards to our doctoral program, their communications are clear, they're, they're, they're thorough and robust with regards to the time and cost to complete a doctoral degree. So there's no evidence other than this little bit of evidence that, that uh, the department is trying to communicate, there's, there's no agreement, there's no corroboration with what they're saying any, any place else. Yeah, and, and it is very interesting because, you know, a lot of people, you sort of encounter a story and there's a whole back history here, which you explained going back to 2004, going back to the early 2000s with the history of becoming for profit, then wanting to come back into the nonprofit space. And, and I know there are some questions about the business side versus the university side and, and all of that, but there's a lot going on here. I have to ask you, in light of this fine, the, the historic nature of it, how large it is, 
And in, it seems like these issues have kicked up with the government in the last couple of years. Do you think that the federal government is sort of waging an attack or a pushback on faith-based schools? Is there sort of a religious element to this? Or do you think there's just another reason why they've chosen to go after GCU? I get asked that question every day about 10 times. Uh, the, uh, there, there are two answers to it, I think. Um, number one, the, the, the traditional university uh, infrastructure in this country is in, a, is in a, a bad state. Tuitions keep rising. Students go in more and more amounts of debt. Programs are taking longer and longer to complete. Um, and there's getting to be a major pushback in, higher, in, in, uh, in, in America, especially from the middle classes, uh, about higher education and its costs, the debt levels, the time to completion, and what people would say is a lack of free speech. Um, what, what's happening with us as universities, other universities declining enrollments, is this thing is just taken off. Um, you know, I thought we had a good plan when we came here. I could have never predicted it was going to, going to go like this. Uh, on our campus, we've gone from 900 students to 26,000 students. Online, we're now teaching 92,000 students. We have a hybrid program. Uh, we're setting up 80 locations throughout the country to do uh, accelerated Bachelor of Science in Nursing degrees because we have a huge nursing shortage. That has 5,000 students. We've got two other platforms. I won't go into the detail about that. But the interest in what we are doing here, in spite of what the department has done, has never been higher. We're running 40% ahead this year versus last year on, on high school seniors visiting our campus. Wow. We'll grow the campus out to 50,000 students in the next seven or eight years. Our online campus will grow from 92,000 students to 150,000 students because of the creative mechanisms we're putting in place to, to, to create teachers and nurses and other areas of, of, of uh, our culture that is uh, that we don't have enough uh, labor. Um, and so they're looking at that and they're saying, you know, these people are going to have a significant reach into the culture. We're the largest private university in the country. In a couple of years, we'll be the largest university in the country. And we do teach from a Christian worldview perspective across all 10 colleges, across all of our programs. Um, and there's a huge appetite for that in the country today. There um, is, for sure. In addition to the fact that we haven't raised tuition uh, on our campus in 16 years, the average student pays less than the average state university student, takes out less debt than the average state university student. And so this is a... a, a, a a, a movement that is gaining momentum. Kids are coming from all over the country, and I think there is a, there, there is a, a desire to to stop the momentum. So, you know, you have said in the past that you will not pay this fine; that you're going to fight it, and you guys are fighting it now. You know. What is there? Is there any part of you that would settle for a lower payment? I mean, are, are you saying no? We are we are going to fight this to the end. We are not paying a cent of this because we did nothing wrong. Uh, yeah, we 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 we're gonna. You know, we haven't talked about this yet, but the the federal Department of, of Veteran Affairs, who was the third agency along with the Department of Ed and the FTC that said they were going to crack down on for profits, uh, uh, they required our local. Uh, VA group in the state, the state approving agency, to do another investigation. Uh, and that, that was about a month ago. And they came in and they did a, a very thorough investigation. They looked at the same things that the, the Department of Ed looked at, that the FTC looked at. Uh, they, they talked to looked at thousands of files, talked to everybody that was involved. This is around uh, specifically the doctoral program, other things, but specifically the doctoral program. And we just got a, a report from them a, a week ago. It said there are zero findings. There are zero findings. Now, if you've ever been to a, a VA audit, you know that's hard to do. We have almost 7,000 students that get VA benefits that attend here. There were zero findings. And so what you have on one side is, is uh, first the, the two judges in Georgia, then the, the Higher Learning Commission, and now the local VA saying, uh, these, uh, there are zero findings here. Their communications are clear and robust. And you've got over here a $37 million fine. And, the, and these people are looking at the same set of facts. N none of this makes any sense. Um, and so uh, we just hired uh, Paul Clement, who is uh, presented in front of the Supreme Court 
uh, over 100 times. He, he represented uh, Hobby Lobby in their disagreement with the government. He represented the football coach who was fired before praying after the game. Um, and he looked at our case and was extremely excited to join our team and say, you know, do we want to do this? Of course not. This is a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. It's a waste of resources. It's a waste of money. Uh, we've got a lot of important work to do every day, and, 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 and the legal fees are mounting up. But I'm getting people say to me every single day, we are glad you're fighting this because it's you today. It could be us tomorrow. Somebody has to fight this. And so the answer is, as of right now, no, we, we're not interested in settling. Um, we are interested in, in, in putting an end to uh, this weaponization of these departments. It's interesting, the, uh, the, the Higher Learning Commission, the local SAA, VA, they did their work here on campus. They talked to students, they talked to faculty, they talked to the administra administration, they looked at all the materials. I've invited them to campus many, many times at our expense to come talk to our students or faculty, get a sense of what we're doing here, why we're doing it, why people are so attracted to it, why they like it, uh, and, and just can't get them to do that. So um, yeah. there's, there's a divide there that we, we're, we're not able to, 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 to cross. Would you say that that divide got worse? Obviously, again, this is a long ranging sort of journey that GCU has been on. Has it gotten worse under the Biden administration versus under the Trump administration in terms of that timeline? I'm just curious, you know, to know, or has the Department of Education being that it is, you know, potentially relatively siloed off doing its own work, has it just sort of been consistent in its treatment? Well, you know, when all this started, it all started because of our desire to go back as a nonprofit institution and then the department's refusal to acknowledge that. Um, and and, and there, there was a different president at that time, and it was a different secretary of education, but they were finishing their, 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 their time. Uh, Betsy DeVos was finishing her time. She was very interested in what was going on in the K-12 world, uh, charter schools, choice, all of that, and she just didn't have much of an interest in higher education. We couldn't get her attention, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, once President Biden got elected, uh, then Elizabeth Warren appointed this enforcement agency uh, and they put this input, uh, enforcement agency in place, and that's when the, uh, you know, the uh, retaliation and, and the investigations and the attacks started. Um, and so um, if there's a different president in a number of months with a different secretary of education, uh, would this change? Probably, but you still have to deal with uh, the unelected bureaucrats that are in the Department of Education that have been there for decades. Um, and, and they have a, a point of view uh, from a political perspective. Um, and, and I tell people all the time, people wonder who we are uh, because we've, we've gotten very large and we have influence. And I say, you know, in, in the Valley here in Phoenix, the Republicans on the east side of town all think we're Republicans because we're a Christian university. We exist as the free market. The Democrats on the west side of town, they all think we're Democrats because we're about inner city transformation. We're about immigration reform because we have 500 DACA students on our campus because of our very, very low tuition. Um, and so we've got them right where we want them. We'll support any politician that supports any policy that supports disadvantaged populations because we believe God put us in this place, in this particular neighborhood, specific neighborhood at this time to do that thing. And so we've tried to stay out of the politics of this. Um, but what you, what, what you get what becomes very obvious to you when you get involved in this kind of thing is that, you know, we've been, we've been trying to take God out of our world for six decades now, going back to the mid sixties. And, and he's got to be replaced by something. And for many people, it's, it's their politics, their politics become their religion and they become completely zealots around their political viewpoint. Um, I think it's important to be involved in politics. We have, I have a political opinion because of my life experiences, everybody does. But for us, our faith will never be, our faith will always stand way above our politics. And it will, it will drive our decisions. And, 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 and uh, it's very different in Washington, DC. Uh, it's very different. It is. And, and I'll say as a final note, and you can feel free to comment on this before we go, but you know, the fact that you're talking to me, that you've been vocal, that is very different. A lot, a lot of observers have said, wow, 
you don't often see this in a situation like this. You know, the university is trying to work with those agencies and find common ground, but it sort of shows that that's not going to happen. You know, and I can't speak for you, but that your openness to talk about this, it's it's a little bit refreshing and interesting because again, we don't we don't see it very often and it seems to show there's probably more to gain by telling your side of the story than by not. Would that be would that be accurate? Yeah, except that, you know, when we when the IRS granted our nonprofit status and the state of Arizona backed it up and then the department denied it, we worked over four years to try to come to a compromise so they would recognize our nonprofit status because we said to them repeatedly, we're doing this for good reasons. This is the best thing for the future of the university. Uh, we want it to be here 50 years from now. They never took us seriously. They gave us one meeting of 45 minutes, which was completely unproductive. When we responded in writing, they never responded back to us. And so we did want a cooperative relationship. We have 26 regulatory bodies, including all the accrediting bodies that regulate what we do. You know, uh, uh, the accrediting bodies that do engineering and social work and education and, and um, business, et cetera, et cetera. We are in very, very good standing with every single accrediting body or regulatory body, uh, except uh, the agencies in Washington, D.C. who have never been here. And so when you, when you, we absolutely are not hard to work with. We're not anti-government. We understand the need for regulation. We understand the need for, for and, and, and all those things. And we take uh, compliance very, very seriously here. And we're recognized for being very good at it. Um, and, and part of what's going on here, I've been working with some people here at the university. We started in a different place, but you know, we've been working together over 25 years. And when somebody comes in here and says that we are deliberately deceiving students in order to drive revenues, I said to the department, are you kidding? The, the, the doctoral program is our smallest program. It is the most experienced students. They've been through higher education for a long time. They've been through bachelor's and master's programs. Now they're in a doctoral program. They understand the world of higher education. Um, all we would have had to do is raise tuition three years or announce we're going to raise it, uh, you know, 3% for the next three years. Nobody would have batted an eye on that. But instead of doing that, we're going to deliberately deceive doctoral students in order to drive additional revenues. None of that. And you said you haven't, you haven't raised tuition in 16 years. Is that accurate? Is that what you said? Before? On our ground campus, we have not raised tuition in 16 years. Uh, that's unheard of in higher education. Uh, our students pay less than the average state university student on our campus, and they take out less debt than the average state university student. You see what's happening here is there's never been a real test uh, because private universities are out of reach for most middle class Americans. This is a real test because our tuition rates, uh, and we put $2 billion into the campus, it's been ranked the seventh nicest campus in the country. Um, our tuition rates are equivalent or lower than the state university rates. And so people have, middle class Americans have a real choice now. And we're watching what they're doing. We have become in higher ed what charter schools and privates are in the in the K-12 world. We represent choice, real choice. And people are voting with their feet. Uh, our students are very loyal to this place. Nobody's more loyal to this place than the parents that send their kids here uh, because they've raised them for 18 years and in, in most of them in the church. And they want that reinforced as they move into college and, and, and adulthood. And, and so they're so grateful and thankful that this opportunity exists for their young people. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know I took a lot of your time today, but helping us understand your side of the story, what's happening here. Um, it's obviously, I know we'll be connecting again. There's a lot more to unpack as this unfolds. Appreciate your time today.